Welcome to Non-Consensus Investing. I'm Ram Alawalia, your host and CIO at Lumida Wealth, where we specialize in the craft of alternative investments. At Lumida, we help guide clients through the intricacies of managing substantial wealth so they don't have to shoulder the burden alone. Through this podcast, we draw back the curtain to reveal the strategies employed by the best in the business for their high net worth clients so that you too can invest beyond the ordinary. Well, thanks so much, Ram, for joining us for this discussion. Many listeners probably already know your background, but for those who may not, we'll just run through a little bit more. Your research has been featured in, in CNBC, in Bloomberg, in the Wall Street Journal. You're the CEO, CIO, and co-founder of Lumina, and you co-wrote a Wall Street Journal op-ed with former SEC Chair Arthur Levitt. You also wrote an op-ed in American Banker. And Lumina's investors, former SEC chair Arthur Leverett, as well as head of former head of KKR Reddit. That's uh, the the flyover. That's great. I wish my mom was here to hear that. Yeah. We'll have to send her a we'll have to send it to her afterwards. An image or something. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Oh, awesome. Let's get into it. Let's get into the discussion. So we'll set the stage here for some of the topics we'll discuss across AI, digital assets, and longevity. Clearly, we've seen a rise in some of these topics here, the the rise of AI, the rise and fall of digital assets that continue to be in the news. You talk about us being on the precipice of a changing world and starting to think about not consensus investing across some of these themes. Talk to us a little bit about what we mean by the precipice of a changing world. It's an incredible time to be alive. We have the convergence of so much transformational change hitting now and in the next few years. We're seeing the resurgence of digital assets and better legal frameworks coming. We're seeing the rise of AI. We're seeing shifts from reshoring and we're seeing a a nuclear renaissance. We're seeing people live longer and better. The best time to be born, if not today, is tomorrow. It's a great time to be alive. Well, I agree with you on that. It's absolutely, it's a great time to be alive. Let's start to cycle through some of these topics first, starting with AI. Clearly, this is what's really exciting. It's it's in the news every day. Public companies are investing, startups are incorporating the AI, investors are thinking about how it impacts their portfolios. But let's just take a step back, talk about the technology and what's the right mental model to think about that. So I think the best framework is to look at this as the rise of the new form factor. So to frame it up, what this slide shows is that roughly every 10 years or so, there's a new form factor. So in the 70s, you had the Unix command line prompt. You had the rise of Windows operating system in the 80s. In the late 90s, you had the browser, the web 2.0 apps like Gmail, et cetera. And then mobile was the last form factor in the 2010s. Now, interesting to note, Mobile as a form factor is saturated, right? Apple is experiencing year-over-year declines in revenue. The personal computer already has been in decline. If you look at Microsoft PEC sales, their declines are double digit. And the same goes for MacBook Pro. So now what AI is introducing is this jump ball in big tech where there's competition to discover and land on the new form factor. No one knows what it is. There's discovery, right? GPT-4 is not a new form factor. It's a browser. It's a keyboard input, maybe voice input to access this. And there are different bids for the new form factor. We're seeing Apple roll out a Vision Pro. They've kept expectations low, calling it a gaming and enterprise device. Although you can be sure that they see this as a way to combine AR and AI and potentially compete for that. And you're going to see other offerings from Google and how they reimagine Android, the browser, search, with AI leading as enabling this new form factor. It's really exciting. Now, when we think about what's happening now in AI, we're already starting, there's a lot of unknowns and we're already starting to see some push back when you start to think about when artificial general intelligence comes and and people are getting concerned. But I want to bring it back to a theme that you've talked about before. You were very early to say that interest rates were going to stay higher for longer. And now we're starting to see Bill Ackman and Chamath and a number of others start to say that interest rates are going to stay higher for longer. You're making a call here that 
AI will be higher for longer. What, what do you mean by that? What I mean here is that we'll be in a slow takeoff world. This is not going to be an overnight transformation where you see mass dislocation. That's one of those things where it's hard to measure progress in one year, but we may be underestimating the progress over the span of five to eight to 10 years. And we're going to see that accelerated change, but it's not going to be immediate. And you can see some of the immediate reactions already, right? So JP Morgan has banned ChatGPT, Samsung, some other companies have as well. But the promise is there. And the early adoption is taking place at startups that are conscious and deliberate about it, as well as creators that are focused on this, where they can get the productivity gains and they don't have to go through a compliance to roll out this technology. The other is that AI has a learning curve. We're seeing a proliferation of AI apps, the dozens and dozens of new AI apps coming online each week. I know we experiment with different ones. Most of them aren't that great, but some of them are and they're useful. But the point is that even AI has a learning curve, right? There was this idea, this meme idea a few months ago that we're going to have the rise of prompt engineers. I don't think that's actually the case. The fact that you need prompt engineering skills is a sign that AI isn't where it needs to be for mass adoption. If you really have to be skillful in that and have to supply the context and supply your preferences and the broader goals you're trying to achieve, then AI isn't ready. You're already seeing declines in GPT usage over the summer. Some of that's driven by student, but there's a possibility that we have a narrative of AI disillusionment emerge. I would expect that, although the promise is real. So the opportunity is there, but it's going to be a slow takeoff world. Makes sense. So the technology is there. The consumer experience is not quite there yet. Maybe this is a, an area where big tech step in. How do you see big tech getting into AI and maybe impact? So the user experience needs to be improved. The technology also still needs to level up and be improved. So if you take a look at, say, Google, and they have a private LLM, it goes by the name of Lambda. And last summer, there were some transcripts leaked by an internal Google engineer who was then terminated for leaking those transcripts. And it shows a level of intelligence that's beyond what we see with GPT-4. So there are private LLMs not available to the public that are very advanced and very skilled. We're not seeing that yet, but that technology will come. And Google has a lot at stake here because if an AI-enabled interface is a new form factor, then the ad revenue at search is at stake. So it's no surprise that Google was slow walking the release of this technology and that Microsoft, who of course owns half of OpenAI, is an agent of change here. I think the other things to consider here is that you're going to see the rise of these smaller verticalized LLMs by industry. Legal GPT is a very obvious one, but imagine psychotherapy GPT, that's going to happen. Finance GPT, Bloomberg already has a version of GPT. By the way, my, my wife works at Bloomberg. I asked the first question, hey, I asked Bloomberg GPT, this is back in, in February or March. I said, what stock should I buy? And it said NVIDIA. And the funny thing is at the time I dismissed it, I said, okay, AI is looking for its own here. It's pushing NVIDIA. But anyway, the, the point is that you're going to see verticalized specialty use cases as opposed to the holy grail of broad-based artificial general intelligence in the style of the HAL 9000s. That's going to be a few years away. But again, based on what we're seeing from Google and their private R&D, that does seem like it's going to be in the offing. So we've talked a little bit about the consumer, what are some of the more specific do? So what happens now is we transform search into getting results. What do I like today? If I'm planning a holiday vacation, I have to search for itineraries. I got to research kid-friendly cities. Got to figure out how to go from A to B. Tomorrow or soon, I can specify goals. Help me plan a vacation. I've got three kids and we want to go to a beach here's a budget and we want to spend eight to 10 days, et cetera. And I can take those goals, those preferences, those considerations, even my preferences in airlines and all the rest, and not only do the research, but then execute upon it. So it delivers the time. And that means that we as a user get the most value out of these solutions by providing personal preferences. We reveal private information about ourselves. This is going beyond cookies. 
this is very, the more value you get from the AI is linearly correlated with the amount of data you give to the AI. So security matters, privacy matters, and it will create more time for users. And people historically have given up privacy for convenience and value. And I expect that'll happen here, but it'll also trigger new kinds of investments, which we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about. But consider, for example, like job, the job search market, like LinkedIn is a primary job board. Sure. That can be transformed. You can instead have a consultative conversation. What is the best career or job for me based on my skills? And you can imagine AI starts doing interviews for candidates on behalf of employers and the different kind of matching process that takes place, or if you're searching for a house as well. So these are high stakes decisions, number one. Number two, those are large markets, the housing market, the career market, we're forgetting about restaurant reservations and travel too, financial decision-making. So AI will transform quite a few industries. So just to summarize that, AI could help us with decision making and also save us time. Is that correct? And we get more value out of AI with the more that we reveal to AI. So the more intimate of a relationship you have with AI, the more value you get. Yeah, it makes sense. Which creates policy question. There's enough for it work there. But maybe let's maybe talk about some of the other areas that you could see AI impacting across enterprise, across government, just beyond the consumer. So there's a lot of focus on the consumer AI. And again, the holy grail there is this personal system AI that is accessing your email. It's on your WhatsApp. It's on your Telegram. It's on your SMS. And it's intermediating all those communications for you. It's summarizing. It's prioritizing. It's giving you suggestions and recommendations so you get more time. That's where the a key battle across big technology firms is like, how does Apple update Siri? How does Google and how does Amazon update Alexa, et cetera, to go after that market? And we talked about the special use cases. Now, the other key verticals, which are not getting enough attention are enterprise AI and government AI. In the enterprise, of course, you have small businesses, you've got large corporates, but in broad brushstrokes, what to expect is AI is tailored to specific roles this is going to be disruptive to tools for HR, SaaS tools for sales, finance, CARTA, all the rest. I'll give you quick examples. Imagine you're a CRO, Chief Revenue Officer for an organization. You want to understand, are you on track with achieving your goals? You want to have a, a line of sight into the top deals. And if you're the VP of a sales unit at a territory level, you want a more narrow scope. And then finally, if you're a frontline salesperson, you want to know exactly what you need to focus on today and get tactical with follow-ups and other tools to get the most out of it. Dashboards are how we try to accomplish this today, but that decision support, that prompting, that direction is what's going to change. What's interesting about it is today, the human is prompting the AI. Tomorrow, the AI is going to prompt the human. The AI is going to say, here's where you should focus. And you can apply that to all of these other kind of roles and functions. A quick one on Carta. Carta is a cap table it's represented in software. A business like Carta is at risk of AI because if I have the data secured, say, on blockchain, mm -hmm. then I can input data using AI and get the relevant information I need as opposed to having to deal with a, a software experience. So... A lot of SaaS will be at risk of disruption. And then lastly, you have the government AI, right? So defense applications are significant. There's an incredible amount of intake that is generated and processed through intelligence agencies, right? So Palantir has been very vocal around this as well. And they allege have something like 300 parties that are requesting some kind of capability. So. We haven't seen that part of this wave yet. So the demand for AI is tremendous. Certainly. As our listeners think about or hear you speaking about the use cases, you're probably thinking about investment opportunities that might come out of this. So let's, let's pivot to investing. What Lumina's principle is to seek non-consensus. What are some of the non-consensus ways to approach investing in AI? So AI valuations are so hot and so high right now, like $100 million 
valuations for no traction, no product, no team, but a concept. So we think that's the wrong move to make. You should look for a non-consensus approach to that. Cybersecurity is a great one, right? So valuations have come in in cybersecurity. The kinds of frauds that will be enabled by AI, now think about here, there's a, an AI generative art of the Pope. There's one of Trump being arrested, Drake. Exactly. There's AI capability that can mimic someone's voice. Think about the risk to voice authentication when you execute a wire transfer. So fraud is going to be enabled by AI and the countermeasure is cybersecurity. And that is a good way to bet on AI without paying nosebleed valuations. Another approach is to bet on data providers that have unique content that can inform AI. So Bloomberg is an obvious example. They're already a large company, but if you have proprietary data, uh, that's valuable in an AI world. That is IP that you can monetize. Uh, and then those vertical approaches, they're much more manageable. They're less costly to set up than a large LLM, although those costs are coming down. Legal GPT, we're already seeing that out there now. A health AI, I'm very excited about. I was talking to uh, VC folks in this category, and they have technology that will enable doctors to accelerate their reimbursement coding. So that accelerates the revenue generation for the doctor. They spend less time on that part of the process. Those are the areas I would focus on. Semiconductors, the silicone layer is another area that we like, that we're betting on. Semiconductors and the silicone layer more generally are obvious direct beneficiaries of AI. The CapEx spend from those big technology companies and government and enterprise are flowing to that layer. And you can measure that. You can see that. What we haven't seen from the big technology reports and the earnings that have come out is the end user demand driving the growth of cloud center usage. We have not seen AI spark revenue growth in Google and Microsoft. Why haven't we seen that yet? It, there's more we have to go do, right? So Meta just published their Llama 2 white paper. The technology is not at that level yet. Look, if Lambda was released, I'm sure there'd be significant demand for that. Mm -hmm. But part of it also is these big tech companies are very concerned about bias. And I believe that's the primary reason they haven't released it. In fact, if you look at the Meta Llama 2 white paper, there's a lot of innovation. How do I get a jailbroken AI to get the most value out of the system? So that's part of it. And just creating APIs and make it easier to spin this up. I think you'll see more adoption. I do think it'll drive growth. But if you're a government, which is a big spender, of course, you have, have budgets for this kind of activity, they have to go through RFP processes, people that discover what platform to build on. Are you going to build off the open AI platform? Are you going to build off Claude 2? Are you going to take an open source approach with Meta? So there are different approaches to take. This is part of why we think we're in the slow takeoff world. It takes time to learn and find the right approach. Much in the same way, before a CTO commits to a technology stack, they have to do some discovery and see what works best for them. Clearly, you don't see your playing AI being the right way to play it, but maybe you want to double click here on, on cybersecurity. I know we, we talked about it a little bit, but if not, what's, what are some of the to play it with? I'll be brief on cybersecurity. We think this is a very compelling opportunity. Cybersecurity was a great thesis before AI, and now it's accelerated due to all the reasons we discussed. Like the need for cryptography, the need for blockchain, the need for preventing impersonation goes up. The need for proof of human matters. Of course, WorldCoin has a thesis around that too. Identity verification. So yes, I, we're, I think this is a very compelling way to, to bet against the thesis. And there's another angle to this too, which is another non-consensus way to bet on AI is focus on early stage startups that have traction, ha that means revenue, material revenue with their target customer. And you're going to see AI show up in lower operating costs and faster revenue generation per unit of burn simply because they're using AI-enabled tools. They're able to get more done faster because they've refactored or they've built their workflows around AI. So we're seeing that now. 
And that's very interesting. So in that sense, you're not actually making a bet on AI as a category. You're betting on a startup that's been able to make use of AI, which allows them to accomplish more uh, with fewer resources. So AI enabled rather than pure play AIs. Yes, AI enabled early stage, focus on valuation, filter for traction. Yeah, we're diligencing a few funds in that manner now where their thesis aligns with how we look at certain opportunities. But I think it's a value venture approach is one way to look at this. But clearly AI has a potential to be quite... How should investors think about immunizing their portfolio or hopefully benefiting from the rise of AI? So it's a great question because we talked about earlier around how AI puts so many industries and sectors at risk of transformation, particularly in the white collar sector, right? Mechanics, we still need them. Plumbing, we still need them. So that's not going to change. In fact, it's, it should create higher real incomes, which should be welcome. There are other categories that should be protected or less at risk from AI. One is, of course, land, real estate. You still need those services. Energy demands should increase as well. Fusion is a couple of decades away. Semiconductor demand is increasing. Rare earth materials, lithium isn't quite a rare earth material, there, it's, uh, but there are other rare earth materials that are needed to generate the silicone needed to deliver AI. So real assets as well. But those are the kinds of investments that will benefit from an AI productivity boom and higher real incomes, right? Tourism, you start to think about what does the world look like when, if in the future, you, if you live in a world of abundance and there's higher incomes, and what do people spend on, right? It's leisure and hospitality, which is already the number one driver of inflation today. So expect more spend on that category as well. So we talked about physical assets. Let's talk a little bit about digital assets to, to shift gears here. Digital assets have been in the news quite a bit. They've risen, they've fallen, but now we're seeing them in the news with the SEC, with SBF getting arrested, with all the fraud in the space. What's going on with digital assets right now? Just give us an update. So digital assets are the best performing asset class year to date. And I think if you pull someone on the street or you call your uncle up, or I don't think they would expect that. They probably are aware of the basic headlines and they wouldn't appreciate that. So digital assets is done incredibly well. It's been a fantastic non-consensus bet. And again, it's up from every other asset class. The sentiment was dour post FTX and also the collapse of Genesis and that put in the market, the market bottom. Anyone that has stayed has the staying power and they believe in the long-term thesis. And that's why digital assets have done very well. And of course, now you're seeing the rise of institutions entering the category. That includes major banks and institutions, includes brands, includes creators and, and others. Let's talk about the institutions, because we kept hearing that the institutions are coming, the institutions are coming. Black, we're, we're hearing about BlackRock ETF. What's happening now with the institutions? So the institutions never left, right? The institutions started their teams post-2017, and then other institutions started their, their teams like JP Morgan Onyx, for example, or BNY Mellon, Fidelity, and so forth. And they've kept building and have kept producing. And now you're starting to see those offerings hit the market. I would not be surprised to see a BlackRock money market fund by year end. Fidelity has invested in startups, and you're starting to see bonds on chain now. So that's very exciting. Now we have BlackRock, the world's largest global asset manager, and Larry Fink advocating for digital assets and tokenization and a, and a Bitcoin ETF. So the international competition, international policy competition from Singapore and from Japan and the European Mika framework, as well as the UK, is pressuring the United States to create a framework that really unlocks the opportunity. Tokenization is a topic that, quite frankly, has come up before. It came up in the last cycle. It's an area you're excited about. You reference letting funds. What's the unlock with tokenization? Why are you so afraid? So the three opportunity areas, one is top-down brand-driven. That means Nike's acquisition of Artifact, for example, and finding new ways to engage with their brands. 
the Dallas Mavericks owner, Mark Cuban, is issuing an NFT to anyone that attends a game, for instance. So it uh, combats against, say, resale. There's new ways to engage with your fan base. That's one. So top down, brand driven. Second is bottoms up, creator driven. And that's an opportunity for a create, creator to disintermediate the gatekeeping publishing houses that are really tastemakers and they're curating this population. Taylor Swift, 13 years ago, had a very small following. I think there's an image somewhere on Twitter where she's at a concert and there's like 10 people in the crowd. Now, if you go on TikTok, there are thousands of artists with the talent, drive, and ambition of a Taylor Swift, but they can't break through the traditional publishing house route. Look, there's a finite number of venues and tour dates and campaigns one can run. The fan and the audience can underwrite that creator. They know that creator best. So think about what Kickstarter has done. The ability for an end user to say, I want to make a bet on that. I want to bring that into the world. I want this to have wider adoption. That kind of opportunity I would expect can be unlocked, unlocked at the NFT level. But the blocker there is that you need reg CF or crowdfunding regulations to be updated and you need copyright regulation to be updated. So one of the frustrating things you hear around NFTs or the critique of digital assets, where's the adoption? The lack of the adoption is because it's illegal today for the next Taylor Swift to raise small dollar funds from her fans to finance a concert tour or publish music, but you can crowdfund political donations, right? There, there's an opportunity there. And also the digital assets, the nature of decentralization isn't compatible with crowdfunding regulation, right? If I'm going to send you an NFT permissionlessly, that doesn't work in a world where you need to have a regulated ATS intermediate transactions. The third category is capital markets, right? And this is near and dear to my heart. I was at Merrill Lynch in 2008 crisis. I literally lived on Wall Street, two blocks from Maiden Lane. I saw the Fed take out Lehman over the weekend while I was getting lunch one day. Crazy time. But the point there is that the 2008 crisis wasn't just about subprime securitization. It was about the lack of transparency in those securitizations. You can create transparency by putting that on chain. But two, it was also about the lack of trust, the lack of trust in another counterparty. So what happened is the banks started charging each other higher overnight funding rates, right? The interest rates in the repo market, or if you measure LIBOR, started going up. And banks borrow short and they lend long. If they can't roll over the short-term financing, bad things happen. So what blockchain does is it eliminates counterparty risk. What's happened post-crisis is we've moved derivatives into larger institutions, larger clearinghouses like ICE. So it creates a different kind of risk. And there's still trillions in derivatives that are not cleared through the blockchain. That's a tremendous opportunity that's in everyone's public interest except for the status quo. What do we need to see from a regulatory standpoint? How do you see regulation play now here? What do we need to see to unlock some of these use cases? Chain. You need an act of Congress, that's one. And two, it would be helpful for the SEC to acknowledge that there are gaps in securities laws, that the third prong of the Howey test, which is a measure of relying on the managerial efforts of others, is incompatible with decentralization. And then you need an update to the Reg CF framework to enable crowdfunding. So there's a lot there, but that's where one should focus. I, of the priorities, I would prioritize unlocking the creator economy because that would give digital assets cultural relevance. Joe Sixpack doesn't really care about digital assets. It doesn't impact their daily life. The Taylor Swift fan doesn't care about digital assets, but that changes if you have cultural relevance. So I'm more excited about that actually than the capital markets use case because the, the ball will roll down the hill once you have cultural relevance, once you have a broad-based population that's advocating for this new method of engagement and participation and enabling Americans to participate in the American dream, to invest and finance content, or perhaps, for example, invest alongside the banks. The banks are originating 
senior loans and Americans have very limited access to investments beyond publicly traded securities. And most of these, there's an increasing amount of securities that are held privately now, right? So there's, there's an incredible opportunity and I think a powerful story there, but you got to update the regulation. Now, from an investment perspective, talked about at the beginning of this segment that digital assets are the best performing asset class year to date. Lumita seeks non-consensus. What are the non-consensus ways to invest in digital? There the, are a couple of interesting things going on. I would say yeah, avoid funds which have a lot of AUM that are writing big tickets with no evidence of traction revenue. They're betting on building the next Ethereum or something, right? That's, that's, I don't think that's the best move to make. There are a few interesting plays. We, yeah, one, I think our first Lumita dinner, we have these best idea dinners with mavens and investors in the category, bring people at the top of their mountain and we exchange ideas. One of our ideas is the Coinbase bonds. We published that on Twitter a few weeks ago, but the Coinbase bonds were 50 cents on the dollar in Q4. They were at 65 cents on the dollar. Now they're at 72 cents on the dollar. But if you believe that Coinbase will honor its obligations, they got over $5 billion in cash, they're profitable on an adjusted EBITDA basis with a path to profitability on a gap basis, then those bonds will pull to par, meaning that you can buy a bond and then at maturity, you're handed the full principal value of the bond, which gives you nice capital gains treatment, one. And then two, you're picking up a coupon, which is attractive as well, high single digits to low teens, depending on your entry price. So those are clever ways to approach it. There's some discount to NAV funds out there. So instead of buying the spot asset, you can buy discount to the underlying because there are discounts that ranging from 30 to 45%. So we think that's a compelling play. That's been one of our best ideas as well. That's done well. So there are other plays here. You can see them on the screen, but there, there's some interesting ways to approach the category. Let's shift gear in and talk about traditional finance and the intersection with digital assets. We talked about traditional financial services. This is an area that my background, I came from Boji, while opportunity that you see it with me, I think you're one of the only people that I know that likes both Warren Buffett and digital assets. So talk to me about how you reconcile for those two ideas. Sure. Look, what is blockchain? It allows you to move money, represent assets on chain and custody trustlessly. That's what banks do and exchanges do. They allow you to move an asset from point A to point B, facilitate a payment or custody. Blockchain provides a decentralized manner to do all of that. And there's an incredible opportunity now to buy a bank and build the next Berkshire Hathaway. Banks are very cheap right now. Barclays has a price to book ratio of 0.4. I'm not saying go buy Barclays, by the way. Their earnings growth isn't that great. That's the reason why it's 0.4. But the point is, are these quality assets out there, they're trading cheap in the wake of the March, April banking issues. And digital assets needs a trusted rail into the real world, right? So mom and pop and Joe Sixpack are going to want a trusted institution to access digital assets. And there's an opportunity for a bank subject to the stringent requirements of safety and soundness to uh, fill that gap. First Republic had a fantastic business before it blew up. They blew up because they were holding long dated mortgages on their balance sheet instead of securitizing and selling them. That's why they blew up. They were insolvent due to that. But First Republic was brought to the public markets by General Atlantic for about a billion dollar market cap after the financial crisis. And then First Republic 40X to a $40 billion market cap in 2021 before it went to a zero. Buffett, I think yesterday just announced he took a position in Capital One, right? He, he has had stakes in the past, sometimes currently around Bank of America, Goldman Sachs, Ally Bank, Wells Fargo. Before Buffett invested in Geico in the 70s, he had acquired three banks, actually. Banks generate recurring revenue. You can borrow short at a lower cost than the US government. JP Morgan borrows short-term at 0%, whereas U.S. government borrows at 5.25%. And you're too big to fail. That's not, I'm not, not a big fan of that from a policy perspective, but from an investor perspective, that, that's interesting. And there are gaps in the market right now. There's a lot to do. In Puerto Rico, you can't get a jumbo mortgage. So there are opportunities out there, and I think it's a very compelling opportunity today. 
What about some case studies? You know the Anchorage story. That's zero to three billion. Now, Anchorage is a picks and shovels infrastructure bank. It's very different than the model is describing here, but that's an example of a bank where you create an enormous enterprise value in a short period of time. And they're the only federally chartered bank, which gives them a, an incredible position in the market because they enjoy preemption across state lines and their ability to provide custody can't be contested legally. From zero to three billion in just five years, and KKR, Goldman, saw the opportunity there as well and invested it. Right. Right. If you're just now to, to talk about another investment opportunity that you see that you're very excited about, what gets you excited about commercial real estate? We haven't seen an opportunity as compelling as now to benefit from the dislocation in the market since 2008. Now, the opportunity set is not going to be as attractive in, in, as 2008 for the reason that we're not going to experience another 2008 with the current kind of challenges, but banks are selling performing loans at a discount, right? There's an article in the FT about how HSBC is selling performing loans at a discount. So you can get an equity-like return for taking on credit risk in that opportunity, and you can provide liquidity to the banks, right? The banks are experiencing about a six to 8% drawdown in deposits. And there's $2 trillion in commercial real estate that must be refinanced now and over the next four years, 500 billion coming due this year. And we're already seeing deals kick out, right? I spoke to a family office in Milwaukee that acquired a class A space from Brookfield at a 12.5% cap rate, right? So they're sitting probably on a 2.5 exer when markets recalibrate and they're getting compensated with an attractive coupon while they wait. And of course, they can depreciate the value of that asset. So the implied tax equivalent return is even higher. These are one of the reasons why real estate is really attractive, all the benefits from the tax code. I think it's a, it's a compelling opportunity to explore this. Mm -hmm. So banks have pulled back from lending to commercial real estate, but CRE's in the news quite a bit. Is it, is this already consensus? Yes, this is a slow moving train wreck that everyone sees coming. Here's how to play it though. The way to play it is not competing for an asset in downtown LA or New York City commercial real estate or downtown SF, which are experiencing the highest vacancy rates. The reason why is because you have private equity funds that see, see this coming, Blackstone, Apollo, KKR, Angela Gordon, Brookfield, all have lined up these funds. And when those assets are auctioned off by the banks, they're going to solicit multiple bids. It's so you're going to get a competitive clearing price. So there'll be some opportunity there. They'll price the bid to achieve their IRR, but competition means that you're not going to get a great deal. And so here's an example from 2008. In 2008, you had these big distressed funds that were bidding on dislocation. In fact, Lehman, of course, went through this, the largest bankruptcy process for that type of institution at the time. Those distressed funds did okay. But the folks that made the most money were the buyers of single family residential and multifamily and buying assets in foreclosure from banks that didn't want to take possession of the asset. So it's providing liquidity and owning these assets didn't, that were orphaned and have a natural buyer. And Blackstone went after that with Invitation Homes, of course. They actually acquired a company that was rolling up these homes. I was also investing in this strategy through different managers at the time. So the way to play commercial real estate, it's those secondary and tertiary markets, Jacksonville, Florida, Houston, even parts of New Jersey, Milwaukee, I mentioned earlier, there's less competition. And the other way is you want small deal size, like a 10 to $25 million asset value, not a $300 million asset value, because then you got Blackstone and they've got cheaper financing behind them and a competitive market. So those are ways to approach the category. Sourcing also matters. So these small community banks, their primary lending business is in commercial real estate. And they have pressure from the regulators now to sell these loans. So if you can source, that's an opportunity. There's 4,000 banks in the United States. Most of them are small community banks. So if you can source, that's an opportunity, right? Blackstone's going to spend time with JP Morgan, HSBC, and primarily the regionals. They'll spend time with investment banks to source those opportunities. But there are players that are focused on that, that we think we've identified that 
So one approach, obviously, is you could go out and buy single family or multifamily, but then you're going to have to go operate that or figure that out yourself. Are there any other asset base or like certain manager strategy? Like yeah. Co commercial real estate's hard, right? Because as you alluded to, your property management, you may have to buy the asset and reposition the asset. That means investing in the asset, getting the contractor crew in there. You may have to deal with the rezoning. You have to work with the local law as well. So it's a very challenging asset class. It's not buying an asset like a bond, which has a QCIP and it shows up in your Bloomberg terminal and you own this. You really have to understand how to unlock the best value in the asset. So I'll give you a quick example. So this manager we're talking to, they bought land and they rezoned it and that unlocked a multiple in value. Other buyers just never saw that opportunity. They just weren't creative. So they didn't actually invest in building anything. They just acquired the land and then they initiated a legal process to change the rezoning from a small kind of merchant shop to an apartment building licensed for 300 units. And so that unlocks value. Those are the things you want to also look for in terms of maximizing the upside opportunity, including obviously the on the ground knowledge. You also want to look for alignment of GP and LP. You want people that have a long-term view, focus on long-term wealth creation and tax sensitivity as well, as opposed to short-term flipping opportunities. Those managers did very well coming out of the crisis. This is one of the headline lessons from 2008. The, the way you made money in 2008 wasn't actually the big short people put on that trade, not in size. Yeah, it makes sure it, it was the big wall. It was buying those dislocated assets post-crisis. That was the big moneymaker from the 2008 crisis. And it was a large asset class. You could, put, you could put that those positions on with size. We've talked quite a bit about your approach to wealth management. Let's talk about health. Longevity keeps coming up. People are looking for ways to live healthier for longer. What are some ways that people can learn more? So this comes up in our conversation with clients like nearly every day. It's not just about wealth, but it's also about health. And it's not about lifespan, it's about health span. So I would, I would submit that the ideal life isn't living to 200. In the last 100 years, you're in a wheelchair. The ideal way to live your life is live with as much health span as possible. That means you're functional, you're mobile, you're active. And then on your last day, you just drop dead and your quality of life wasn't impaired. That's the best way to live life and focus on health span. We at Lumida, we're all fans of fitness and consume a lot of content from Andrew Huberman and Peter Atia and Dr. Randra, Don Rhonda Patrick, who's at the Salk Institute, which looks into anti-aging, Ray Kurzweil. What we've done is we've consolidated the best tips from the best books and organized that here for you here. I've got Peter Atia's book right here, Outlive. It's a fantastic book. Recommend that. Now, what are some of the ways, like, why don't we currently live to 100? What are some of the reasons we don't like? Aging is a disease. By the way, I'm not giving any medical device here. I'm just summarizing what we've run and shared. Go consult your physician. There you go. Disclaimer. Okay. Here is a frequency distribution of how people die on that table on the left. Number one is cardiovascular disease. That's the highest probability of mortality. And beyond that is if you don't have those issues, and the next one that's out to get you is cancer accidents and stroke. Uh, by the way, another key factor of mortality is making left-hand turns while you're driving. <laughs> so that shows up on the table number six or number seven. I always do a triple check when I'm driving and make it a left-hand turn. I've always informed everyone in my family to be cautious around left-hand turns. So what we've done here is identify for each of these categories, what are the risk factors that you want to measure? And then what's an approach one can take to mitigate, including strategies that are non-consensus, both on the measurement and on the treatment. There, If you read the literature, Peter T is a doctor's doctor. He's a concierge doctor. If you want to hire him, you spend $150,000 a year and he will advise your primary care physician. That's what concierge medicine is. It's another growth trend, by the way. For example, the standard of care when you go see your primary care physician is they'll do a lipid test. It's called a basic lipid test. What we've seen in literature is you want to get an, an advanced lipid test. So it's not simply measuring LDL and HDL, but it's measuring the nature of the LDL, namely, are these small, dense lipoproteins. Those are the ones that cause inflammation, can cause atherosclerosis. That's one. Second is getting a CAC score. 
So it's not standard of care until you turn 45 or so. But when you get a CAC score, they can measure the level of atherosclerosis. And if you're at a zero percentile, you're good. If you're not, then you should consider taking intervention. VO2 max testing. VO2 max is a measure of the efficiency at which your lungs can process and reoxygenate the oxygen and the hemoglobin in your body, right? There are ways to measure this and you can spend a day trip and we have some facilities identified on the page here and they'll measure your VO2 max. Those first three tests, by the way, are cheap. You can afford them. I think people should consider taking them if you're in your late 30s. So that's what, uh, when you go to the doc, next time you go to the doctor, you're going to ask them for advanced lipid tests. And CAC testing. And then you've got to be informed. You have to know what do you do with the result of that? That's the, and how do you act on this? So this is the approach. This is how you measure under cardiovascular disease, under heart disease. Yeah, that's helpful. And we all know like diet, exercise are things to focus on sleep as well. But what are some other tactics? Again, you're not a doctor, obviously, but what are some of the things that the literature is to consider? Diet, sleep, and exercise, that works. Of course, the, the, I think the challenge is it's adherence. That's the thing. People know what's good for them. There are things that people don't know what's good for them too. That's part of it. But it's how do you design a lifestyle that allows you to adhere to a strategy that involves recreation, play, and mutual accountability to accomplish your goal. So what we laid out on this page here is a set of best practices. If you can do this, you're, you are going to be doing much better than your peer group. By the way, any exercise is better than zero. Just get off of zero, not just for digital assets, but on exercise. <laughs> the first hour of exercise in a week has far more impact than the second hour. The second hour helps too, and the third hour helps, and the fourth hour helps. But some exercise has a significant marginal impact. That's one. Obviously, on diet, the Mediterranean diet is... People have different biology too, so you really have to measure. Some people have CGM devices that measure glucose response rate to different foods. If you really want to geek out on this, on sleep, a CPAP, which is where you have a mask over your mouth that injects oxygen. The people that have this swear by it. They sleep incredibly well. And that is something people can consider if you have challenges around sleep. Obviously, controlling when you have exposure to blue light. Sunlight matters. The earlier you get sunlight during the day to activate your circadian rhythms. So one of the first things I do in the morning is get some basic physical activity and get exposure to sunlight. I'll walk outside before I'm even fully dressed just to get the light in your eye. And then around noon, get another exposure to sunlight. And then in the evening as well, because the nature of that light... Um, will trigger the appropriately timed release of melatonin, which is a hormone in your body, to anchor your circadian rhythm. And obviously eating too, right? Avoiding eating three hours before bed, avoiding sugary foods before bed, avoiding caffeine after 2 p.m. Those are all the best practices category. There's a lot one can say around all of this, just trying to move through some of the highlights. But I think the main takeaway is how do you achieve adherence? How do you ensure you're accountable? If you have a trainer, that helps, right? You don't want to disappoint your trainer. You don't want to, trainers are going to charge if you don't show up. That's another way to drive accountability. Or I know, Dimitri, you have a tactic. I believe you and your, your newlywed, but you've, why don't you share your strategy? Yeah, we will do a lot of this together. I think one of the best things is to have accountability with family and friends. It's either us working out together or implementing these strategies together or working out with a family or a friend. That's right. And there are also supplements that may be relevant based on the nature of the risk factor that we've identified from some of the research here. The thing about supplements is... And and supplement, obviously, you want to consider, have to talk to your doctor before considering taking any new supplement, right? These are over the counter, but yeah, it's always good to get, it's always good to get advice. These are over the counter. But for example, krill oil is the only fish oil that can pass through the blood-brain barrier. And there's some good studies that Dr. Rhonda Patrick you can reference her around that, sulforaphane as well. There's a lot to do based on what you're trying to address. And you have a slide up here about NAD. What, what, what is NAD? So any, this, is a, this is a spotlight on one particular supplement just to raise it in one's awareness and attention. But NAD is a naturally occurring coenzyme found in all of our cells. It plays a, a role in mitochondrial function. By the way, I'm a son of a doctor and a brother of a doctor, so I can fake it, but again, I'm not giving medical advice here. But uh, so NAD declines over time. You can see that on the chart on the right. 
And so now there are over-the-counter supplements being delivered to the market where you can supplement your NAD levels and there's indications that it increases your energy levels. Now the manner of ingestion matters because if you digest NAD through your digestive tract, you will get no benefit. So some people take this intravenously or take it sublingually under their tongue, right? So you have to think about the right approach rather than buying NAD plus and then you're wasting it because you're metabolizing it. But that is very interesting. And mitochondria where in inflammation and cancer issues and metabolic syndrome and insulin resistance that that does start at the mitochondrial level and obviously the pancreas too, but those are something to research further. So tell us for those who may not be familiar, what is possible about Lumida? Sure. So we're a private wealth business. Think of us as the Iconic 2.0. If you're familiar with Iconic, I believe that there's an opportunity to build a modern wealth management platform by modern, what does that mean? It means modern investments, like 60, 40 is dead. It's not working this month. They don't work last year. And we have a new world we're embarking towards, right? Higher real rates changes everything. We're on the precipice of an extraordinary amount of change and alternative investments matter. We talked about a few of those here, but there are other alternative investments that matter as well. My eyes were open to this when I was at Merrill Lynch. I left Merrill Lynch and started investing in this post-crisis. And so we take a holistic approach. We're a fiduciary. We're not a broker-dealer. That means we're bound to a duty of care. We're regulated by the SEC. We're SEC registered investment advisor as well. And we focus on high net worth to family office. And we start with their goals and objectives, risk tolerance, tax sensitivity, liquidity needs. We work backwards to develop a plan that helps them accomplish that using novel strategies that other wealth managers are not familiar with, have access to, because oh, we need a modern, we need a modern approach. Here you're on the modern approach and providing that wealth management and trust and estate and tax services. So to learn more about Lumida, can the website is www.lumida.com and then Twitter, LinkedIn, and TikTok at Lumida Wealth. Great. Thank you, Dimitri. Thank you everyone for your time. Really appreciate it. Look forward to staying Thanks in touch. So Care. Be well. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening in on the episode. Remember, in the world of investing, the road less traveled often leads to the greatest rewards. I'm Ram Alawalia, your host and chief investment officer at Lumida Wealth, where we specialize in the craft of alternative investments. Invest wisely, stay ahead of the curve, and stay non-consensus. <laughs>